10 games to go, 17 points required for Tottenham Hotspur to get the 70 points that we need, that we should need, to guarantee top four slash top five that should put us back into the Champions League for the 24-25 season. An exciting season, guys. A very exciting season because there's a new format. 36 teams come in. There's more money to be made. UEFA have brought out all of the details today around how much money is on offer. And let me tell you something. It's eye-watering. How important is it that Tottenham beat Luton on the weekend? How remiss could we be for not getting past Fulham, not getting past Wolves twice this season, for dropping points against Everton? It is Angie's first season. Of course, there is a lot of context baked into anything that happens, and a lot of patience. But when there's an opportunity to get your hands on a cheeky 80 mil, you've got to take it seriously. We're going to talk about it right now. We've got all of your, not your Tottenham transfer news, views, and clues. We've got stories about the hotel. We got stories about UEFA, and we got to see how you guys are doing. The guys, the Spurs talk show. Oh, it starts right now. Uh, yeah, guys, it's great to see you. Sorry I haven't been around the last couple of days, to be entirely honest. There hasn't been too much to talk about. Also, I had a filling, and I got a new dentist. And I think she's straight out of dental school because she's quite young. And, you know, like you'd give patience to Ange. You'd give patience to a puppy when they struggle to get to the back door in time. You give patience to a lot of things in life. The one thing I don't particularly want is a new dentist to look like she pops acne because she's so young. And I think she screwed up my tooth. It doesn't clench properly. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm in a lot of dis comfort and i think i've got to go back true story she sat there and said you don't need to, i don't need to dig out anything because the feeling that you already had is just going to be replaced so you don't need an injection i was like hmm? not sure about that she put the, the the drill to my thing turned it on within two seconds i thought i was going to hit the roof and she goes okay sorry we'll put the injection in so i've had a terrible start to the week i hope your week's been better I've also looked like I've uh, wet myself out of my boobs, but it's just a bit of water. How are you guys doing? Welcome back to the Tottenham Hotspur News, Views and Clues show. I hope you're all happy and healthy doing the things you love. Let's see who's in the house. Boxing Hotspur 57. He says zero, as we will not be participating. This was, what I think, because I had the initial title saying how much money Tottenham will earn from the Champions League. And then I saw Donna, the number one Agomba, shout out to you saying, we are not there yet, mate. We've got to get there first, mate. Um, so I changed the title to something a little bit less, the tempted fate a little bit, a little bit less. The football gods were probably watching. Anyway, good to see you, Donna. Good to see you boxing. Spurs King, leave you spent the cane money on a new kitchen. We must get you over Champions League so we can renovate the spare bedroom. <laughs> well, you know, man's got to sleep. Man's got to sleep in comfort. Drew Zillis in the house. Pick up everyone. Hope you're all having a good day. You know the rules, smash the like, shoes off, check your sub. Not much to ask. Let's have a great show. Big up, Mr. Butler. It's good to see you, Drew. I hope you're okay, mate. Uh, gonna get gonna get you guys on this week. I still haven't got around. I've been so distracted. I haven't got around to texting you, but I will do. I'm not ignoring you. I promise. Great to see you. Do smash the like button, guys. It's free to do. The more the more likes you get to hit, the more chances I'm a happy boy, because it will hopefully push push things out to a new uh, to new audiences. Scripting ones in the house is critical so that we can win the quadruple. Don't quote me on this. I just have. I just have. Clip it. Mike Barrows in the house. Good to see you. Spurs GC TV. Good evening, Sean. Hope all is well. All is well. All is all could all has been better. All has been better. <laughs> but we go. We move anyway. Good to see you, Robin Owens. Good day, friends. I hope you're having a great day. Same here, mate. Same here. I hope you are too. Stephen Wilson, good to see you. Scooter reacts. What's going on? What's crack a lack him? I haven't seen you for a while. Morning, Sean. Big up all. A win versus Luton is a must for us. Pull the tooth out, son. <laughs> I was thinking about it actually, because the, the the fear of going back, having to go back to see her tomorrow, or whenever I rebook the appointment and say uh, it's not working, something's not working, it still hurts, and I think there's a problem. Uh, I don't think I want. Anyway, this isn't a dentist show. This isn't a Sean Health show. This is a football show. Let's get into it. Derek Smith in the house. Good evening, mate. Good evening, Tommy boy. Good to see you, Tom. 
I'd go to Turkey. Yeah, I might do. I have a toothache too. Yeah. Sorry, mate. More miserable than England. Sorry to hear that, Bill. Sorry to hear that, buddy. Star Crow, not fussed about the Champions League unless it truly means our summer transfer budget changes. Look, I think it will do. I think it will do. If we qualify, it's meaningfully different. And I'll explain why when we go through the data. Boy, Machiavelli, um, not to be negative, but why does Champs League matter? How many times have we qualified for it and failed to push on for silverware? We should genuinely be trying to win something. No, I get it. I hear you. And of course, this year, we'll go through it in a second. The rules are that if you don't do too well in the in the Champions League this year, then you're out, you know. But there's a lot of chances to get into the last 16 because, you know, the, the first 16 by right get – the first eight, sorry, qualify. And then from ninth to 24 – we'll go through it. We'll go through it in a second. Um but anyway, yeah, wh wh why is it important? It's important for money, mate. It's important for money more than anything. I know people hate to hear it, but it's what makes the world go round. And it's what makes the ability to go and spend money um, so much easier. Because Tottenham do all they can do from the revenues, from the season tickets, from the concerts, the rugby, all that stuff. But the Champions League revenue in and of itself is a massive slice. We'll, I'm, I'm going to get it up now in a second. Watch the Wolves game tonight, please, Sean. Watch the Wolves game. The, oh, the Wales game tonight. Sorry. Um, I don't really watch international football, mate, to be honest, but I will put it on in the background. Uh, Spur Boo Boo, Henry 14, the goats in the house, as is. Oh, he's in, he's in a way. Oh, Henri 14, the goat. You should flap. <clears throat> Good to see you, mate. Star Crow, almost would rather Europa, better chance of silverware. Jack Legros, Champions League football. The way we're playing, no chance. This is good to see you guys. Let's get straight into the news, right? I'm going to start off with some news, news, views, and clues for you for today. And we're not going to spend too long talking about it. But report names of Spurs at uh, was Spurs as, as Atletico Madrid's main threat in the race for the 24 year old. This is about Edison, Edison, the Atalanta player. Look, a really good player. If you're looking at the at the, the eye test on him, he's wonderful. He's versatile. He can play on the six. He can play. Um, in the kind of eight, he, he gets forward, he chips in with goals. And a brilliant player from Brazil, you know, turning things up over there. I'm a big fan of his. Here's the issue, though. And I put this out on Twitter just quickly. Put this out on Twitter the other day, right? This is Edison's uh, stat, stat profile, okay? If we're looking for, let's look at, I've, I've got these templates set up. Let's look at him as a defensive midfielder for a second. Just keep your eye this is all that green, all the green bars represented in pie chart format. So he's in the top 85 percentile for dribblers tackled. He's not particularly great at clearances. He's good at blocks. Percentage of dribblers tackled, tackles one. He's a very good player, sort of final quartile, right? 75th to 100 for the defensive work. Um, and for when he's on the ball, he's pretty good at, at beating the first man. But in terms of carries, take-ons attempted, touches, he's kind of mid-range level stuff. Yet this guy is thought of as one of the most all-round midfielders in, in the Serie A and someone that Tottenham are looking for. I'm just going to show you this for a split second because I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend too long talking about it. I've got a video I'm doing later this week with, uh, with Guy. Guy Masterson's coming back. And where is it? Is it here? No, let me bring it in. Hang on a second. Here we go. So everyone's saying that Eves Bissouma is the problem, right? The six is a problem. I've been saying it. I said, I don't think he's the monster six that we need. I think he's a better in the eight. We haven't seen him play the eight. I don't know who the right six is. But in terms of everything you're looking for in a midfielder, all of these things that are on the screen here, it's basically all of the stuff that you should be looking for if you want someone to play defensive midfield. Someone who can pass the ball, someone who can can uh, tackle, someone who can hold the ball up, someone who can break the line, someone who can dribble out, and someone who can progress and has brilliant passing. And so I was like, listen, I feel like Basuma's had a brilliant first 10 games of the season. You know, then he fell off the fell off a little bit and he's definitely going through some poor form. But is it just form is temporary and class is permanent? And then I went and dialed this stuff in. Now, have a look at this guy. This is, is Basuma. Let me see if I can, I don't know if I can do it so you can compare, right? I'll bring this down for a second, but look at the difference. Passes attempted, 96%. This is over the last 365 days, last year, over 1,745 minutes. So 
what's that, about 20 games of football, give or take. 96th percentile for basic, 97th, 8th percentile for basically everything that you need in a passer. Progressive passing distance, he drops down to the top 10 percentile. Progressive passes. So he, he might not be at the very highest end around Europe, but he's certainly up there. In terms of touches, take-ons, um, passes received, 96th, 97th percentile. And defensively, versus all other midfielders, there's not a, there's not another midfielder in the Premier in the certainly in the Premier League, or but there might be one or two others across the top five leagues in Europe that are as good at tackling people that are dribbling at him. Interceptions, 94th percentile. Tackles, 95th percentile. Anyway, I'm not going to spend too long talking about it because I've got a whole show, well, a part of a show segment. I'm going to talk about it with Guy. But I just wanted to show, like, if we're looking for Edison because Basuma's not the guy, if we're looking at Florentino from Benfica, above, I've got a great, I've got a video coming out, like top 10 midfielders that Tottenham could go after this summer. I'm going to be dropping it in the next couple of days. But I'm looking at a few of these players Florentino, the fella Palacios from Leverkusen, Edison's in there, Connor Gallagher. So we got like, you know, all the big names that we've been linked with and some we haven't. But I'll be honest, there are not many of them that statistically compare, compare and compete with Yves Basuma. Now, I know Basuma's had a bad last sort of segments this year. 2024 has been poor for him, so much that he's been dropped by Marley. So it's, you know, it's, everyone agrees that he's been off, off form. But if, if all of those poor performances are baking in, they're all baked into these stats. So how good must he have been in the first 10 games of the season for him to have stats that look as good as this, even baking in the last seven or eight games where he's been playing and playing really badly? I don't know whether we've got the wrong guy. I don't know whether class is permanent and form is temporary. I don't know if, if, if Ange wants to go in a different direction. But I do think this idea that Yves Basuma is the problem, which is a narrative that I hear a lot on Twitter, not sure it is entirely fair. Anyway, we move on. We move on. So we've got the story there about Edison. We're not going to talk too much about him. Um, just done that one. Next story for you today, guys, is about uh, Christian Romero. Right? So he wants to take part. Um, have I read this story out? Tottenham Blowers 25-year-old star could miss the entire preseason and the start of the next campaign. Tottenham defender Christian Romero doesn't want to take a break and has revealed he wants to play for his country at the Copper America this summer and the Olympic Games days after that. The men's football at the Paris Games starts on July 24th, just 10 days after the Copper America final is held at Hard Rock Stadium in Florida. The double duty means 25-year-old Romero will miss Tottenham's preseason and even the first few weeks of the new season if Argentina go all the way in both competitions. He said, I never had the chance to be in the Olympic Games and I would love to. Obviously, it doesn't depend on me, but if you want to take me, I am available for the Argentine national team. I continue with the same enthusiasm and desire as always to continue doing things well at the club, to continue having the possibility of being there. Um, here we go. They have improved under their Australian... I missed this a slice missing. This thing's hiding some content there. They have improved under their Australian manager, but having crashed out of the League Cup and the FA Cup, they'll need at least to secure a Champions League football. Yada, yada, yada. Anyway, I just want to stop for a second and see what you guys are saying about Christian Romero on that particular note. Uh, is there any... Is there any... Are we gonna, can I see us getting... You can see us going for Matt's Weifer. Weifer, Weifer. Yeah. Good player. Really good player. Um, there's a couple of players over that way that I, I wouldn't mind seeing. They're, they're going to be in the video. Nice view. What are we looking at? Was there something on the show on that on the uh, channel? Yeah, look, I I just don't know. I don't know what's uh, what's going on. But Romero moving to excuse me, Romero going to the Copper America and then going to the Olympics. <sighs> I thought the Olympics was supposed to be for players that are like under twenty one or something, and amateur players, aren't they? I'm not sure. Let us know your thoughts, guys. Let us know. You're very quiet in the chat tonight, people. What's going on? Very, very quiet indeed. Hi, Sean. What's happening, Frank? Good to see you. Good to see you. I hope you're doing okay. All right, let's move on to the next story because Romero, for me, he goes, if he misses the entire preseason and into next season, I get it. South Americans love their national team. I'm just not a fan of national football, so I don't hold them in the same regard. I didn't like it when Richarlison said 
He is country before club. I didn't like it when I thought that Romero kind of eased out of the Premier League a couple of weeks early. He wasn't really going in for it when we had the World Cup mid-season last year. You know, maybe it's a me thing, but I'm not going to be happy if he disappears and misses the first few weeks of the season to go and play in the Olympics. Not at all. Anyway, let's move on to... Uh, oh, no, this... Hang on. The last story I wanted to talk to you about was this guy. Um, so, Barad Tiramalai. I'm not sure how you say his name. Uh, he's very, very busy today at Spurs, wherever this man is. He's put out, like, four or five different things. He says, according to the print edition of Record, as relayed by Sport Witness, Sporting Lisbon are hopeful that Morton Heilmand will reject Tottenham's advances and sign a... Con sloppy, mate. Sloppy. Tottenham's got an M in it. Got to do some proof work. Read your copy before you put it out. And sign a contract ext extension at the club. Kuhlmund has been a revelation since his move to Portugal from Lecce last summer. The 24-year-old having taken the Premier League by storm. This guy is a number six. He's a defensive midfielder. Um, but look, I'm not a... Uh, I'm not a... Where's the... Here we go. Here he is. If we're looking for defensive midfielders, again, you compare that, compare that to Is Basuma. Am I missing something? I must be because Is Basuma is apparently not not good enough for Tottenham. A lot of people are saying, and yet all the players that we're linked with, I'm I'm not a massive, uh, massively aware of how good this player is on the eye, but in terms of the stats, you know, what are we doing here? He's a defensive midfielder and he doesn't do much uh sort of not 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 tacking not taking on dribblers, not really doing many clearances, not massively successful with his tackles, 72%. Don't know. On the ball, on the ball stuff looks shaky. I'm just saying I think we could do better. I've not even really thought about this guy. He's not on my list or my radar at all. But that is the report, guys. That is the report. Let's move towards the uh, this this football, fi the finance stuff. You came here for some financial stuff and some finance stuff is what we're going to start with, uh, what we're going to move to. So this is Tottenham, Tottenham's plans for a new hotel next to stadium approved. This is a bit of a nothing burger, but I have seen people on Twitter going on about it. You know, Daniel Levy, you know, spending money where it shouldn't be spent and all that stuff. Look, this money, this was part of the Northumberland uh, redevelopment plan. The money's already been sidelined by Enoch. It hasn't come through the Tottenham books. It won't go through the Tottenham books. And it's part of the plan. It's part of the, the complex. And I, if you remember back in Christmas, they had planning extension uh, approved to add another, another five floors uh, or another, another five stories or whatever. And, um, and they're going to, it's going to start. It's basically going to be ready by 2028 for the time that the Euros come to England and that the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium will be used for some of those games. Um, might be a bit of a distraction, I guess. You could see it as the negatives of it. Oh, it's a little bit of a distraction. But in terms of does it affect Tottenham's budgets in any way, it doesn't. But actually, is apparently, you know, the plan has always been that eventually the money made from all these things will filter their way back in to the stadium um, sorry, into the into the accounts. If we go back to 19th of December 2023, Dan Plumley, a football expert, football finance expert, Dr. Daniel Plumley, um, was speaking about this. And he said, Spurs confirmed that planning commission of 180 hotel and blah, blah, blah. The finance expert did admit after looking at their proposals that it is unlikely for Tottenham to take all of the windfall, but a fair amount will end up at the club. He said, on a negotiation basis, Spurs would obviously want a proportion of that at the very least. It does depend on how the apartments work. If they're permanent residents, the hotel, who owns that? You can look at Spurs in there and part of the bigger picture we've seen. It's another example of a savvy piece of business linked to the longer term plan for the stadium. We've seen them generate good commercial deals through that stadium already. This is another example. He said, I think it's unlikely, the way it looks at the moment with the proposals, that they will be able to take all of the windfall from it. But you would imagine that they will take a fair proportion of it. And again, another way to diversify your income and, ge and generate additional money from your stadium when it's not um, on operation on match days. This is what a lot of clubs are looking at now. How do we diversify that income? What can we do with the stadium and surrounding assets we have when they're not in use? And I think this is another good example of it. So, yeah. Not really much 
of a story. But for those people who were curious to know, you know, is it going to affect Tottenham? Is it going to, uh, is like any Champions League money going to get sidetracked to, you know, pay some builders off to build some concrete or whatever, some cylinders? The answer is no. All of that money was sort of set aside from Enix coffers a long time ago when the stadium, the whole Northumberland plan thing was, was organised. But hopefully when the profit is made on the, on the um, you know, and, and it's all paid off and, it's, and it starts to yield some ongoing profits, then hopefully some of that will make its way back into Tottenham. Time will tell. Um, the same could be said for a lot of things around Tottenham Hotspur. And generally speaking, it's very difficult to look at the, the financial accounts and know exactly the breakdown. If you, if you remember the financial accounts, in fact, you now have to remember, I can show you. This is, I'm going to be using this in a second. This is essentially the kind of the detail that they go into on the financial stuff. They sort of categorize the money from the football club in four buckets, match revenue, uh, match receipts, UEFA prize money, TV and media and commercial, all of the money from things like Formula One and Beyonce and rugby, all of that stuff falls under the commercial banner, unless there are, um, uh, I don't actually know, to be entirely honest, whether or not the concessions that are sold at the stadium for things like, you know, beers at a Beyonce concert, whether that would fall under the match receipts or under the commercial, I'd imagine we fall under the commercial, even though beer sales and concessions and burgers and all that stuff falls under match receipts um, for, the, for the Premier League season. Anyway, uh, let me just dial in, catch up with us. What's, what's everyone saying? Is anyone saying anything? The questions that come to immediately to mind, let me get rid of this. Hang about, guys. Hang about. Let me get rid of this for a second. What were you saying there? The questions that come immediately to mind are, should Tottenham be telling Cootie that he shouldn't play in the Olympics and or Copper? Would you tell any player they shouldn't play for their country when? Um, I think he's okay to play in the Copper. The Copper's like a proper, legit tournament that's f the equivalent of the European Championships, right? So I think there's no problem there. But the Olympics, I think, is slightly different. I'm pretty sure there's rules around how many people above a certain age. I remember we, we had an Olympic team a couple of years ago, didn't we, or a few, a few years ago. And it was mainly people between the age of like 18 and 22 that went. I think we took two or three or four players that were like, maybe Kieran Trippier went or something. I can't remember, to be honest. But I don't think it's like a, I don't think you can just take your full, your, Beckham went. Did Beckham go? Someone fill me in. Someone fill me in here. Um, shouldn't we as a big club have a light replacement available? Yeah, it's true. That's true. Three over the age of 23. Cheers, Code Critters. Appreciate that, my man. Um, smash a like, says Nicky Boy. Yeah, guys, 250 of you in the house. Really appreciate it if you hit the like button. Cost you nothing. Really helps the channel. It starts to spread, spread the love out to new people. Um, hit the subscribe as well, if you haven't already. Sean and chat. Is Benson Core playing with a broken toe in recent weeks for real? Apparently, apparently, I'm not a fan of this. I, I think that Tottenham players have got this new this newfound propensity to keep things quiet and then after the fact come back and say, oh, I've been playing injured for, for months. Sonny, was, Sonny did it. Richarlison did it. Benton Core did it. I'm sure there's someone else that would say they've been playing injured for months. I'm like, then don't play. Don't play injured or own your form. If you're going to play injured, if you're, if you're fit enough to play, then you're fit enough to not use it as an excuse for poor performance. Um, call me harsh, but if you're fit enough to play, then you shouldn't be calling out your injuries after the fact. It's excuses, I think. Um, as long as it goes back into the team, says Tom, I'm not bothered, but this is Enoch we are talking about here. Well, I, I think, look, it does, it will go back into the team. It's one of those, when you look at the Tottenham Hotspur accounts, you've got the state, you've got the, the, there's like 40 different companies that all have different um, reports. There's the golf club stuff. There's the the property portfolio, the flats down the down the high road. Um, there's the area behind the stadium. They're all on separate businesses, but uh, allegedly it's all going to filter in at some point. But how that looks and when that's going to happen, I don't know. And it doesn't give you any indication when you look at the financial reports. I was going through it earlier, taking a, a, another look again, because the actual financial reports for this year, or sorry, for last season, still aren't out. The official ones still aren't out. So what I'm going to have to do for today is use 
the kind of suggested numbers that come from Deloitte for the purposes of the art of, of the conversation. But we'll come to that in just a second once I've said hello to a few people that are coming in. Um, good to see you after a few days. Short. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, guys. Like I said, I've had a bit of a dental thing. But we've got a few streams. We've got Tomorrow we've got Devil's Advocate. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. with Dave and Johnny. And then at 3 o'clock on Thursday, we've got Guy. Masterson and myself, but I'm trying. I'm going to find up, get another person on that I haven't had on yet. I'm I'm looking forward to bringing on. Um, if they are, I've been on carrying on injury. Yeah, exactly. Hundred percent KM. Subscribe so that Sean can do a proper dentist. <laughs> no, to a proper dentist, not that one doesn't know what. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Argentinian and Brazilian players put country above all else. It is. It's part of. The, I get it. Extreme national pride. I like some English players who could care less about their car. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yes, there are rules around the Olympics, but that's irrelevant to whether he should go, shouldn't go if called. Yeah, true, true. But he's over twenty-three, right? So would he be one of the three? I hope it's a nothing burger. Sean, the stadium has its rebuilding payment over twenty-five years via bonds and got favourable interest rates. So if the club. Has that set has that aside with all the outgoings plus sur surplus revenue left? Where's the money? Well, yeah. So we're paying a four point. I think it's four point two percent interest rate on the twenty five year um, long long term debenture, long term debt, secured debt. I mean, there's lots of money. There's been lots of money. There's two hundred million quid in cash on the accounts. Um, you know, still lots of money there, and hopefully more coming in. Get Jory on. I will get Jory on. I will get Jory on. So what are you saying, Sean, that it's tooth for tooth and all about the tooth, 100%. You can't handle the tooth. Why can't I see you, Sean? I don't know. Hello. I'm here. Um, right. If you're fit enough to play, then don't blame injuries for shit for 100%. Can't stand it. Can't stand it. If you're injured, you're injured. But if you're not, if you're playing... Then poor performance is not. Oh, I've been. I had a broken pinky. Sorry, not interested. Anyway, guys, let's get back to it. Right. So, what I wanted to show you today was. So the story is out about. Um, let me get this up. Here we go. Are you guys all familiar with the new the new format? Right. Where's my So the new format, just in case you in case you weren't aware, obviously traditionally it's um, eight groups of four. You play each other. You, you you get put in your group. You play the other three teams twice, home and away. And then if you come first or second, you qualify for the last sixteen. If you come third, you drop into the Europa League. If you come fourth, you're out altogether. Well, that's nothing. That's no longer going to happen anymore. As you might know now, there's thirty six teams. They're at, they're adding four more teams, and essentially. You get to play each other. You get you get all, all 36 teams get put into four different pools. And then you play two teams from each pool. One of them you play at home. One of them you play away. You only play each team once. So you're going to play eight different teams. Four of them you're going to play at home. Four of them you're going to play away. If you qualify after all that into the top eight, you go through to the last 16. If you qualify from ninth to 25th, then you will play in a playoff, a home and away playoff to then join the other eight teams to go into the last 16. So it's kind of like a last 32 thing. And then the eight teams at the bottom get sent home all together. No, no, no drop down to the Europa League. Um, as you know, there's four teams that are going to get promoted, uh, four teams that are going to get a chance to come up. One of them is, or two of them come from the team who's with the, with the best uh, European coefficient. One of them, I think, comes from France. If they if they qualify third, and then there's another another league that go another another entrance for someone outside of the, the normal traditional leagues who wins their who wins their own national league. I think it's the team with the highest coefficient that wins their national league that don't qualify by right or something like that. Anyway, 36 teams, and you get to play like I say eight games, and go from there. Now, this is how the financial stuff works, right? So what I wanted to show you before I get into it is to try and figure out the difference. The, let me get rid of this quickly. So 
I couldn't get this all done. To, this is all in pounds. So I'm going to have to confuse you a little bit here. This is in pounds and the Deloitte thing is in 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 um is in euros. But in a nutshell, this is this is estimated from ninth for this this last line over here on the right hand side is estimated for this year's figures that we have for last season that we haven't seen yet. That includes the Champions League revenue and it's in it's in euros so it's not really 631. It's about 540 million in pounds. But in a nutshell, we made about 100 million. Yeah, I see here. I've written it down here. 225 million pounds, 261 from commercial, 207 million pounds from broadcasting, and 116 million pounds from match day last season versus the year before. You can see the numbers in the year before. Obviously, last season we were in the Champions League. What's difficult, though? I, what I was trying to figure out, I was trying to do some crunching numbers for you, for you people. I was going to bore you to tears to see how much money really came from the Champions League versus how much of the additional, you know, match day revenues came from the uh, just people spending more money or how much more came from the, from, from the, in the broadcasting, how much more money of that difference, that 50 million difference there between 182 and 235, how much of it was from the Champions League, how much of it was from the Sky Premier League TV rights that you got a bit, a bit of a boost on, and specifically in the commercial sector, how much of that difference was from Champions League versus how much of it was from additional concerts and that stuff. And it's impossible to tell because if you compare back to this year here, or sorry, back to the year before with the official results, they break down, Tottenham Hotspur break down the categories by four ways. They have match receipts, which we have on the other one, match day, right? They have UEFA prize money, which they don't have here on this one. And then they have TV and media and commercial. And over here they have commercial and broadcasting, which is TV and media. So in a nutshell, I don't know how they have factored in or where Deloitte have factored in the additional revenue from the prize money. Because prize money doesn't naturally fall under match day. It doesn't naturally fall under broadcasting. And it doesn't naturally fall under commercial either. So I don't really know where the prize money uh, from, from this particular, where it would be on these figures next year. Now, obviously, this is reflecting on the season before when we were in the Conference League and we only made 10 million. And the 2021 is from the, the year before that when we were in the Europa League and we only made 23.6 million. But I'm going to show you now how substantial and significant the difference is getting back into the Champions League. Let me just double check that you. I haven't bored you all. Have you all fallen asleep yet? Let's have a look. You still with me? Isn't it two million for a win? Yeah, he's gonna. I'm gonna show you that stuff now. What was our transfer spending? I don't know. That's a different conversation. Uh, I personally think it's better format group stages. I completely agree. Uh, will it affect next year's numbers? How many extra TV games we got this season? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, all, all the TV money count is is one hundred percent effects. But listen, when these figures come out for next uh, for this year, um, when Deloitte, oh sorry, for for next year's numbers, because we're not in the Champions League this year, you can expect it to be about eighty million different, eighty million quid lighter than it would have been last season when the numbers come out reflecting on Conte's Champions League um, campaign. So. Here's the story. Now, oh, I need to get rid of that thing off the screen again. Go away. What am I doing here? Here we go. Sorry about that. Hiding my pretty face. So, here's the prize money, right? Taking part in the UEFA Champions League can prove extremely lucrative for a football club. As such, it's treated but as the pinnacle competition, yada, yada, yada. For the 23-24 campaign, compet compet uh, competition organisers have announced that the total purse for this season's Champions League will stay the same as last season, 2.3 billion or 1.74 billion. So the Sporting News brings you a full breakdown. Yada, yada, yada. I've got the wrong one. I've got the wrong one up here. Here we go. So this is for next season, right? 2.1 billion pound. Where are we? Here we go. I've got the wrong thing. Hang on a second. Where is it? Here we go. Tottenham are in line for a payment 
of 18.62, 16 million pound, should they qualify for the new look Champions League next season? UEFA shared details of the payment breakdown for the 24-25 season in a revenue distribution document published on its official website. Each of the 36 teams that qualify for the league phase will receive an, that aforementioned payment regardless of how they perform. Tottenham could therefore lose all eight league games and still land a hefty windfall, which is an an increase of 13.3 million from this season. So you're already 5 million um, better off than you were last year. The payment is made up on the initial down payment of 17.87 million and the rest made up in installments as the campaign goes on. Spurs are currently fifth in the Premier League, which could be enough for a place in the Champions League group. As Postacoglu finished fourth, blah, blah, blah. here we go. That's because, as per the UEFA report, 2.45 billion, so 2.1 billion, massive, massive increase of about 15%, will be distributed to clubs in that competition alone next season. That is a little over 74% of the official UEFA prize pot of 4.4 billion. So the other two tournaments get two, uh, get 26% between them, and the Champions League gets 74% for each of its club comp uh, competitions in the 24-25 prize pot. Even making it to the qualifying phase and losing is worth 3.7 million, but that is not a category Tottenham needs to be concerned with. If they make it to the league phase, Spurs will be given a further 2.1 million for every victory and 700,000 euros for each draw. To put that into perspective, guys, right? In the last last season's Champions League, in the six, we played th uh, six, we won three, we drew one, drew two and lost one. If we were to extend that same sort of thing, I, I made some sort of like very sort of scruffy notes here. If we were to play eight games in the next next year's Champions League, let's say we qualify. Obviously, this is all speculate speculation. So you get 15.64 million just for qualifying. And then if you were to win four of those games, draw two and lose two, which would get you somewhere in and around the first eight or nine positions to be able to qualify for the last 16, you would get... £13 million pound in additional prize money just from the game. So you've already got 15.64. Then you get another £13 million on top of that, right? Which is £29 million quid, give or take. On top of that, you then qualify for the last 16, which is what Tottenham did last year. And then you, you get an extra 9.6... Sorry, this is in euros. 9.6 million. So just for Tottenham to do exactly the same as they did last year, but under this new format you would get 38 million euros in prize money. I want to now show you this other, uh, this is just the prize money side. And that's just getting to the, the, the last 16. It gets a lot bigger as you go down. There's also this thing called a coefficient payout. So some 30% of the prize money, around 600 million, is paid out to all 32 clubs in the Champions League group stage based on a coefficient algorithm that ranks their European performance over a 10 year period the teams are then ranked according to this algorithm from number one to number 32 with bonus points given for hoisting european trophies not something Tottenham have done in the last 10 years but before the money is paid out in shares according to a team's rank the lowest ranked team earns one share while the top ranked team earns 32 shares so someone like a man city or a real madrid more than likely or a bayern munich or a god forbid chelsea those sorts of teams are going to be the ones that not that Chelsea will get there anyway, but they'll be the ones that will be at the top end of the thing. I would say Tottenham's coefficient points. I've got no idea what it is, but I would say for argument's sake that it's going to be about halfway up, halfway down, right? So on that basis, you can expect if the bottom team gets 1 million and the top team gets 36, then let's split the difference and say another 18 million euros. So we're already on eight, 38 million euros for prize money for qualifying for, into the last 16. And you've got another, another 18 on top of that would take you to 56 million. And that's before TV money's even paid out, guys. And here's the TV payments. An additional 300 million euros, 15% of the total purse, is made available as part of the broadcast revenue once all the broadcast deals are finalized across the continent. The National Federation for each country represented in the UEFA Champions League is provided with a share of this money based on the proportional value of each TV market. So you immediately know that the UK or that the English Premier League or the English uh, is going to be right at the very top end of that. Each national federation then distributes that money to the participating Champions League clubs based on 50% of the money goes to the National Federation will be divided among the participating Champions League clubs 
from that nation based on fixed percentages determined by UEFA. So UEFA will give, I'd say, of the 300 million, England, England, Spain and Germany, etc., are going to be at the very top. But England will be the number one, no doubt about that. So I would imagine that you could probably see at least 30% of the money going to the teams that come from England. So that's about 100 million euros. Now, I'm not going to worry about, you know, the determination by UEFA of who gets what. And the other 50% is paid out in the proportion of the number of matches played by each club. But let's assume, just call it even Stevens, right? Let's call it every club gets 20 million. If you were going to get 100 million, 20 million each in euros again. So that's 56 million we've already got, plus another 20 is 76 million euros that Tottenham Hotspur could earn just from prize money, TV money, and the algorith algorithmic coefficient over the... Uh, just to get to the last 16, it goes up significantly if you would get a lot further. Now, on top of that, match day revenue... So I went back here to check out what Kieran Maguire said about this because I forgot about this. Kieran Maguire said, have I got this up? Have I got the screen up? Yeah. As calculated by financial minister Kieran Maguire, Spurs make 5.6 million, 4.8 million pound every match day when taking into account gate revenue and money spent by games um, while also deducting how much it costs clubs to host matches. So let's, let's stick in euros for the time being. So 5.6 million you're going to play at least four games to get um, at home. So that's, what's that? 5.6, that's 22.2 million euros, right? Is that right? 5.6, 11.1, 11.2, sorry, 22.4. So another 22.4 million, plus you're going to play a fifth game if you get through to the last 16. So another 5 million, so that's 27 million, give or take. We'll call that 28 million quid. 28 million quid on top of the 76 million is about 104 million euros just from the four, the four categories we've spoken about so far. Shawnee, I just sent you the coefficient rankings on WhatsApp. Oh, interesting. Well done, Ben. Let's have a look. Let's have a look, see. So we are going to get right into the weeds then. We're getting right into the weeds here. <laughs> Appreciate you, Benny boy. Appreciate you. Where are Tottenham? 34th. Wow. Over 10 years. Hang on. Over, is this over a 10-year period? Oh, this is 2023-24. Can you do it over a 10-year period? Here we go. 10-year club coefficients. Perfect. One, two, three, four, the, all these guys will be there. Five, six, seven. Chelsea won't be there. Um... Man United hopefully won't be there. These guys will all be here. Yeah, okay. So if you take out a few of them that might not be there, then Tottenham will be 16th, 17th, which is what I said. Perfect, Ben. I appreciate you saying that. Just to confirm the math then. So we, we were right about 16 million euros for the coefficiency thing. So that's 104 million euros. Just to get to the last 16 goes up significantly after that plus you haven't factored in we have we haven't factored in corporate contracts so a lot of those sponsorship deals the AIA the get here if we're still using them who are all the the various the various sponsors that we have at the football club will be paying more because of the additional exposure uh, the additional kind of airtime the, the sponsorships around the stadium all of the ele electronic lights they'll be paying more because of the um, access to a bigger broader audience. Modfile that you saw. Big up, Benny Boy. Good to see you, mate. So, basing it on the Daily Mail. Who's basing what on the Daily Mail? Guys, bad news. I'm cutting down for your streams. Not happy. Not a fan. Whatever. Um, anyway, so 104 million pound times that by, well, sorry, divide that by 1.14. Let's run it up to 110 million because of the, the contract things. So 1110 divided by 1.14, because that's the euro exchange rate. 97 million pound, guys, is what Tottenham will make, give or take a couple of million here or there, if we qualify fourth or fifth for the Champions League. 15 million just to get there, 15 and a half million just to get there. 
plus an extra 20 million in the guaranteed match day receipts from the four extra games. So just for getting there, you're guaranteed about 50 million in terms of the additional match day receipts, in terms of the media money, in terms of the coefficient points, uh, the and the contracts. 50 million just for getting there, whatever happens for playing in the group stages. But if you do get to the last 16, add an extra 50. If you get to the quarterfinal, add an extra 20, I think. Amazing. So that's why it is so important that Tottenham Hotspur figure out a way to beat Luton on Saturday, to figure out a way to beat Arsenal in the Champions League. Because, guys, because there's 10 games to go. There's 10 games to go, and there's not a lot in it, is there? Where's that? Where's that screenshot? Fourth, fifth, and sixth. Now, we know that fifth place is 98.4% certain to get the last spot. Right? So it's pretty much going to be fifth, unless something crazy happens with Leverkusen going all the way in the Europa League and Liverpool dropping out early and West Ham and Villa dropping out early, etc. or City getting beaten by Real Madrid. I'm not sure of the connotations, but it's going to take a miracle, but fifth place will get it. But let me ask you this, guys. Are you that confident? Are you that confident that we're going to beat Manchester United to fifth spot or Aston Villa to fifth spot, fourth spot? There's six points in it. Man United have got some tough games coming up, but Tottenham have got a, the hardest running. Tottenham have got the hardest running. And I don't think our form is consistent enough for anyone to sit here and say with, with chest that we're definitely going to do it. Because I don't know what's, what version of Tottenham is going to turn up. If I'm entirely honest, I feel more confident watching Tottenham play against the better teams because they don't really come and try to exploit us. They're just going to play their own game, game theory stuff. But let's have a look. Are you confident? MS is very confident. We'll finish above Villa. Also got Van de Ven, Madison and Vicario without championship money. Yeah. The problem is, though, I know people say, like, oh, what's the point of qualifying for the Champions League? You're not going to win it. And I agree, you're not going to win it. And if, if I'm entirely honest, the old model, if you qualify for the Champions League, won a couple of games, finished third, dropped into the Europa League, for a club like Tottenham, it could have been a nice way to try to kick on and, and do bits. But this under this new model, there is no drop down. So you're either in it and then you're out. And to me, the I, yeah, I, I don't think we're in a position where we're ever going to win the Champions League. But... That extra 50, that 50 million guaranteed and that potential 100 million in total. You know, FFP Kings, we got the money. You know, if you get, if you finish fourth or fifth, you can really lean into players like Conor Gallagher at Chelsea, if that's who you want. Edison at Atalanta, if that's who you want. You know, More, Morgan Gibbs White. By the way, talking about that. Sorry, I'm going to have to do a video about this, about this on the other channel on Sean Butler TV. By the way, get over to Sean Butler TV if you haven't already. Hit the subscribe button over there. Chelsea, have you seen this story? Uh, let me get it up. Chelsea's, what's her name? Marina Granovskaya, right? This one, this, this, this woman. If Chelsea are not bent over... For this particular breach. It's amazing how this comes around, right? So the former Chelsea exec, so she 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 was his assistant at Chelsea, chief executive of Chelsea, right? I won't bore you with the details, but in a nutshell, she was working at Chelsea and he something happened in like Turkey. I think it's or Cyprus. Here we go. Yeah. As a result of the Cyprus confidential leaks report project. So there was Something happened in Cyprus where loads of uh, leaked emails came out because someone hacked them or something. And bizarrely in it, it basically shows that some third party business that Abramovich owns made loan payments of like 15 million. I've got the story. I can just read it out rather than just guessing. Here we go. The files suggest offshore companies in the Abramovich network made loans to Granis Granovskaya worth seven and a half million to finance the purchase of a house in Fulham near the club's 
Stamford Bridge Stadium and a payment of 1.63 million for financial tax and legal due diligence. Basically, they were paying her off the books to, yeah, the, so the three loans, the three loans to her worth a combined 12 and a half million documents in the leak reveal. According to credit agreements, two of the loans worth a combined seven and a half million were to finance the purchase of a property. Less than six months later, land registry filing show Granisgaya bought the home in London for five million. At least seven and a half million of the debt was to be waived for subsequent debt forgiveness deeds. So in a nutshell, you can't just give people money because it will get taxed by the HMRC, but you can loan them money if you know the right way of, of uh, setting up your offshore accounts. You can loan people money and then forgive the debt, which is essentially what Chelsea did with Abramovich when he got kicked out. He had a billion dollars of debt on his books, but he forgave the debt in order to get out, like, get out of the country. But this woman was getting paid all this money in offshore deals to buy houses so that she wouldn't get the that so that that money wouldn't get put through Chelsea's books so that it wouldn't count against their FFP, which is exactly the same accusation that Manchester City were accused of doing with one of their managers when he went, I forget which one it was, during that investigatory period, when he went over to Saudi uh, to Abu Dhabi in the off season and got paid like 10 million pounds for a couple of consultancy gigs. It's all just ways of misdirecting the revenue so that it doesn't sit on your cost basis and it allows the top allows the top line to remain higher and the bottom line to remain higher where the costs are not occurred, incurred. And if Manchester City are going to get charged for it, then 100% Chelsea should. And when Chelsea are already in the mud for all the other things that are going on with their FFPs and their mispayments around Willian and all that stuff back in the day that's coming out now, surely to God, I, I'm very conscious of the fact that these deals are very, these, these investigations are much more complex, much more historical, archived um, irregularities that will take forever to go through the paper trails of. I get it. But at some point, Chelsea have to have their day in court, just like Manchester City have to. And if Nottingham Forest get a four-point deduction, which I agree with because they broke the rules, but they did what they did in the name of sustainability. The whole point of the rules is to make sure these companies, these football clubs are sustainable. And Nottingham Forest turned down a bid of £12 million less than what Tottenham paid for Brennan Johnson three weeks earlier that would have been inside of the reporting period that would have got them out of trouble. Consequently, they didn't because they knew they were going to get a £12 million better off bid from Tottenham three weeks later. They waited for that, got that, broke the rules consequently, and then now get a four-point punishment, which might see them relegated to the, to the championship, which will cost them about 50 million quid in lost revenues over the next two years, even with the bumper payments. So if Nottingham Forest are getting hit and Everton are getting hit for genuine breaches of the rules, but doing what, well, at least in the case of Nottingham Forest, doing what they thought was in the best interest of their sustainability, then what the hell should happen to Chelsea and to Manchester City <clears throat> if they are proven? And when it comes to Chelsea, it kind of looks like they would never have known about this had it not been for that leaked um, email thing in Cyprus which leads you to think of how much other nonsense has been happening in how many other clubs over the last, what is it now, 14 years of FFP, 2009, I think FFP first came in, and then 2013, the rules became a little bit stricter. How many other owners have got offshore companies? All of them, right? All of them have got offshore companies, ours, ours included. All of them have got offshore companies, I reckon if, if these stories only come out when there's a leak because someone gets hacked, <laughs> it's a disgrace. Like I think that I don't know. To me, if I feel like I feel like I, I really hope that Chelsea get the book thrown at them. Almost more than Manchester City, because Chelsea were the kind of Chelsea were the groundbreakers on the sugar daddy nonsense they were the ones that broke ground in it they set the precedent everything else has come since then since then let's just hope we're squeaky clean says tom martin i think that we i think with, it, with regards to our footballing finance i think we probably are but in terms of our owners are like you know 
Not that he's our owner anymore, but the geezer, uh, Mr. Lewis, certainly isn't clean, is he? Certainly isn't clean. Um, but anyway, 100 million quid we can get from finishing foot fourth and then doing a decent, or fifth, and then doing a decent, decent ride. 100 million quid on top of whatever budgets are available for our summer window. Massive, right? At least you get the 50 because you know, you know you're going to get 50 million quid from additional additional gate receipts from the TV money and from the initial prize money. You know you're going to get 50 million quid more than you would do if you didn't have European football. You'll probably get 40 million quid more than the guaranteed amount of getting through to the Europa League. So that's why it's so important, guys. That's why getting through, beating Luton, that's why losing at, at Fulham could be more meaningful than just a bad day at the office. That's why losing at Wolves could be more meaningful twice than just a bad day at the office. We need to figure out a way to be less inconsistent with our form. And as I said at the start, to go 360, people are saying that Yves Basuma is the problem. Is he? How can you say that someone who's in the top two or three percentile against every midfielder in Europe is the problem? I think he's got bad form. For sure, something's going on with his form. But... I don't know. I don't know. <sighs> What's everyone doing tonight anyway? I'm going to round it. I just wanted to do a cheeky hour with you. I was going to, I took the video camera out earlier and it started to rain and I think now it's broken. So, um, problems. Smokes and mirrors, MS. Yeah. Good deduction, Sean. Appreciate that, mate. They were definitely banging. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. She's, she's hot as well, isn't she? Let's have a look. Can we see her again? There is she. Marina. Yeah. She probably was hot. Yeah, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's 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 a good looking girl. Good looking girl. Very good looking girl. And about 10 years ago, she would have been tip top. <sighs> what are we thinking, guys? Are we gonna beat Fulham? Beat Luton rather? Are we doing them? How's Levy clean? Well. I don't think anyone's clean. I think I've always I've always agreed with people who are on the other side of the Levy debate uh, when they say, you know, because I used to kind of talk about, you know, the, the, the idea of getting in sugar daddy ownership from the Middle East and talk about the kind of the moral hazard around sports washing. Like, are you okay with that? You know, I I don't really care either way about that stuff. But I don't see the benefit of having a sugar daddy from the Middle East when the rules now have changed to the point where the only benefit of having someone that's got more money than he knows what to do with is if there's things that he can do to the football club that don't affect the FFP, i.e. infrastructure. And Tottenham have already maxed all that stuff out. So there's very little benefit, in my opinion, to having having a sugar daddy from the Sultan of Brunei or whatever coming over and buying Tottenham out. Other than if you just don't think that Daniel Levy is a good decision maker with regards hiring and firing and negotiations. And if that's your main gripe, then, and if you also believe that Daniel Levy will never step back from those things, despite having Paratici or, you know, new, you know, like what's, what's the Jim Ratcliffe? step back and get involved in any of the negotiations or will he hand everything over to Dave Brailsford, you know, or Michael, is it Michael Edwards at Liverpool who's going to go back in there? Will he take care of all of that stuff? Um, does Par How much does Paratici do? How much does La Johan Langer do and Scott Mann do? I don't know. But if your gripe is you want a new owner because you don't think that we're ever going to spend enough money or that you want us to be able to have, you know, go and buy 500 million quid, those days are over with FFP. If you want a new owner because you think that Daniel Levy is bad at decision making, then <laughs> then obviously you can get someone else in. But I don't. There's not not necessarily any reason to think that the Sultan of Brunei or whoever Shake Shake Rattle and Roll would would have any more skills in that department either. It's all about hiring the right people that are football guys, right? And I don't know for the for the large for the for the main part. I think that Paratici is pretty good. Um, not don't know too much about Langer. Don't know too much about Scott Munn. Time will tell. What will be interesting though is if Tottenham 
um, move into the multi-club ownership model. Because I don't know if you've seen, I put a video out on uh, Sean Butler TV yesterday about the multi-club ownership model with regards Manchester United and that they might not be able to, if, if they, if United were to qualify for the Champions League and Nice were to qualify for the Champions League in a higher league position in France, as it stands, Manchester United wouldn't be able to participate. They'd be kicked into the Europa League because you're not allowed to, because, because, um, uh, so Jim Ratcliffe is the CEO of the wholly owned owner of Nice, which is Ineos Group, and he is in charge of footballing operations at Manchester United. And so you can't have these conflicts of interest, even though Manchester City do it with with, with Genoa. Uh, not Genoa, with... Um, what's, man, what's the team in Spain called? Oh, my mind's gone blank. And they and they bought Savio. They bought Savio from from that team um, for twenty five million quid when other teams were bidding forty million euros for him. Look at Leipzig, Girona. That's it. Cheers, Benny boy. Look at Leipzig. Um, bought Benjamin Sesco from Salzburg for twenty five million quid. United bid fifty million euros for him, and they said no. We're going to go. We're going to give him at half price. You can't tell me that there's no conflicts of interest just because nobody who works for Salzburg is also on the board at Leipzig and vice versa. It's, a, it's such an absolute nonsense. Not that it, I don't care about United whether they are in the Champions League or not, but it's an absolute nonsense to suggest that because there's no official representation, that there's no overlapping conflicts. Right? It's just absolute waffle. And UEFA... Don't know what they're doing, honestly. There's the bureaucrats that are just an absolute disgrace. Anyway, we could buy Cravadonna with all that Champions League cash, but we won't do it. Do you think Cravadonna would come? Would nice would, would Nice then attempt the United rescue by dropping a few points? Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't exactly, but like if you're a Nice fan, like let's be honest, I'm not trying to bring in kind of xenophobia or whatever but the french hate the english there bill foley who owns bournemouth his team was trying to buy lorient his his uh his multi-club ownership group was trying to buy fc lorient last year and the ultras of lorient went fucking mental they like almost tore the uh stadium down they put up we don't we don't want to become part of a multi-club ownership group we don't want to play second fiddle to some english team in the end, even pulled out of the deal. So I don't think Nice would be very happy. The Nice fans wouldn't be very happy to, to play second fiddle, especially if they go and sell John Claire Tadebo at below market rates to Manchester United. Because where did Nice get their money from then to go and replace a potentially a world class player? You know? I don't know. I'd love Tottenham to get into that world, though. I would love it if we went and bought a team in Sweden or Denmark or start off in Scandinavia. That seems to be a hotbed of talent right now. Maybe that Jur Garden. Maybe someone else. Go and get someone. Go and get a team. You know, give you something to be excited about as well, right? You'd, it'd be nice to have a Scandinavian team. Anyway, guys. Just thought I'd go through it with you. I'm sure if you were just to have a, hazard a guess and say how much money will Tottenham make from the Champions League, you'd probably say about 100 million. But we crunched the numbers and it looks like you would get about 100 million quid. So if you thought, if you had 100 million, that's for getting to the quarterfinals. or oh, sorry, to the last 16. If you go further, make a lot more. <sighs> Let's do it. Let's beat the Luton. See you tomorrow at three o'clock. No, two o'clock for Devil's Advocate with Johnny and Dave. and. Uh, you still want Tadebo. You should buy a team in South Korea first. Do you know what, mate? I never even thought about South Korea, Benny boy. That would make the most sense to Daniel Levy, wouldn't it? Then there's a justification for a preseason tour to the kind of cash kings of Korea every single season. Yeah. Go and get all the next best talents. Bring them over. Tourism up numbers up. 100%. Anyway, appreciate that. Hope you have a good night, guys. Wonderful. I'll see you. We all know why you want the Swedish team. 100%. I want to go over there, mate. Lose a bit of weight. Go over there. Find my own Ulrika. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, South Korea would be great. 
Right, guys. I'm uh, thoughts on Walker Peters. Not for me. I don't, I don't. There's a reason why Walker Peters didn't leave Southampton last year. Um, I don't know what the reason is, but it can't be good, right? You go, you you go down to the Championship and you stay. What are we doing? I don't know. Good player, but he's not going to elevate us, is he? That's a kind of. That's not really the level we, you want. Tottenham need to be going for bigger and better than that, surely. This is what I want now. Top, I need to see Tottenham. Like everything's coming together. You got the FFP situation where teams like, oh, that's what I was going to show you. Sorry, don't go, don't go, don't go. Look at this. This is from okay. This is the most up to date stuff. Twenty one, twenty two. Under the new UEFA rules. Under the new Euro, uh, Europa, um, UEFA rules. So it moves away from profitability and loss, and it moves to. Um, percentage of revenue spend right look at the teams that are still screwed everton this is from a year this is a year out of date but here's what it is everton 181 million in revenue um 170 how's that work 181 million in revenue 173 million in in wages wow that's mad. Newcastle United, 180 million in revenue. Obviously, they would have been got, got a bit more, probably another 50 million for qualifying for the Champions League. But 180 million in revenue, 170 million net spend on wages. Look at Wolves. How close are they? If the threshold is 85% under these new rules, you can see the teams that are still going to struggle. Is there a player at Burnley that you could that you fancy? Is there players at Crystal Palace? Hello. That looks pretty close, right? What's uh, what's 20% of 16? 32. Knock off 32 of that is about a hundred, about 20. Yeah, they are right on the they are Crystal Palace are very close to the threshold. If if that if these numbers are consistent now, they won't be, they'll be slightly different. But if they were quite close, if the new threshold is 80% under the new Euro for rules, Crystal Palace will be right on the on the borderline. We'll have to sell some of their bigger earners. Who are their bigger earners? Joaquin Anderson, you take him. Gahey, you take him. Decore, you take him. I'd love Decore. I think he's a monster number six. You'd take Eze and you would take Elise. So, and the teams that are okay on the thresholds, they're still the teams that are okay now. Top them absolutely fine. Look at that. Best by a country mile. Anyway, it's all very interesting. If you're interested in football finance, you know where you can find it over here or on Sean Butler TV when I talk about that stuff regarding other teams and things that's going on in outside of Europe. Um, you can find the link for that in the description. I'll love you and leave you guys. Go and enjoy your evening. I'm off to watch Married at First Sight Australia because that's how sad I am. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, come on you Spurs.